All right, so in this video, I would like to talk about Nietzsche's concept of the eternal return or the eternal recurrence, sometimes translated as. But specifically, I want to talk about this concept in Deleuze's reading of this concept. This is one of Nietzsche's most confusing and vexing concepts. People have been studying this for ages. There are so many different competing interpretations of what exactly Nietzsche meant by that, what he was trying to do with that idea. And I'd say very roughly, there are kind of two popular interpretations. One would be that it's essentially a kind of thought experiment or a device for living a life that's has a non-resentful attitude, let's call it. Basically, everything that one does, everything that happens in one's life, one should be able to affirm it fully and sincerely and wholeheartedly. So much so that even if it were to happen over and over again for all of eternity, that you'd be cool with that. That's one possible interpretation of, of where Nietzsche was going with that, with this idea of the eternal recurrence, that one should imagine everything as an eternal recurrence. It's like a kind of exercise or ethical training to build a strong mind and a healthy, a healthy attitude. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is more reminiscent of certain Eastern religious traditions. So ideas of incarnation, for instance, you can think of the idea of the eternal recurrence as essentially referring to the idea that everything that lives is constantly and perpetually kind of reincarnated in this long run cyclical dynamic. Now, what Nietzsche really meant, I'll leave up for debate. I'm not going to try to settle that here. I just wanted to give you two summary interpretations of what this idea means in Nietzsche, this idea of the eternal recurrence. But now we'll move on to what Deleuze thought about this idea or how Deleuze interpreted it, which I think is really useful and surprisingly apropos for certain contemporary cultural and political debates. So in his book on Nietzsche, Deleuze has some very fascinating and quite brilliant passages in his analysis of Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. One of the more memorable is his discussion of the dice throw. He asks us to think about the eternal return as a kind of dice throw. And he says a few things about this dice throw, but here's what I think is especially interesting or important. He talks about the dice throw as having two components or stages or moments, let's call them. The first moment is the throw of the dice, where one is essentially, in practice, affirming the role of chance in life. To roll a dice means that you're, you're, you're embracing or throwing yourself into whatever fortune has in store for you. But the second part is when the dice falls back. And that's when necessity is revealed. And so these two parts of the eternal recurrence both require fidelity. They both require affirmation. One has to be faithful to both parts of these, just not only throwing the dice, but also accepting the result as necessity, affirming that necessity. And so to Deleuze, the idea of the eternal recurrence is the idea of this kind of dice throw. It calls on us to not only roll the dice, but to embrace and accept and affirm the results of that dice throw. And every passing moment is essentially a new dice throw that all of, all of time or eternity, one might even say, is a incessant succession of dice throws. To see life in this way and to live as if this is the case is what is at stake in this idea of the eternal recurrence. What's interesting about this is it has very different implications for how one ought to live. And at the end of the day, ultimately, I think what Deleuze is really interested in is this question of how one might choose to live. This is a point that is made quite well in Todd May's book, which I was just reading recently for the Deleuze book I'm writing. That's the essential question, according to Todd May, in, De in all of Deleuze's work, is how might one live? 
not how one must live, but how one might live in a context where after the death of God, there is no real external constraint on any of us. How one might live is the question. And so the dice throw is a really powerful heuristic for thinking about how one might live. But what I find really interesting, and this is what I discuss at length in my book on Deleuze, based Deleuze, is that the way you read this socially or politically is actually very up for grabs. There is a easy and naive interpretation of this, which suggests that it's kind of like the, you know, socially liberal nihilistic type of person who you might have met in your life who says things like, ah, fuck it. It doesn't matter. It's all futile. Just let chance decide. Constantly throw yourself at whatever comes your way. And that's all you can really do. So that's a kind of nihilistic, socially liberal gloss. And I think that's probably the one that a lot of Deleuze readers are kind of most inclined to naturally. That everything is chance and everything is a roll of the dice. So don't worry too much about anything. And just constantly be rolling the dice and feel free to constantly go wherever the dice send you, as it were. But that's a very, very naive reading. And I think it actually is the absolute opposite of what Deleuze was really trying to get across in his reading of Nietzsche and probably also what Nietzsche was trying to get across. But we're, we're going to focus on Deleuze here. The political implications of that naive reading are easy to understand, right? If that's how you see the eternal recurrence, if that's how you see the dice throw, then you don't really have to worry about any commitments. You can kind of constantly change your commitments. Let's say you are in a monogamous relationship with someone one day, you can just kind of call that off the next day if you feel like it. You can cheat if you want. You can uh, flitter about in different pursuits and projects. And it doesn't really matter if you stick with anything because it's all just a roll of the dice. In other words, this interpretation really kind of undervalues or sets aside the significance of characteristics such as commitment, loyalty, fidelity. These things are actually undervalued if you take this sort of view of the eternal recurrence. But I actually think what Deleuze says is quite clear in that his concept of the dice throw, his reading of the eternal recurrence, actually deepens one's obligations. It deepens one's commitments. It raises the value or priority of characteristics such as commitment, fidelity, loyalty, obedience. The dice throw, according to Deleuze, is actually a kind of intellectual device that allows us to hold on to commitments despite the fact that after the death of God, there are no external constraints. So let me explain what I mean by this. To affirm the dice throw doesn't mean you get to abandon the results of some previous dice throw. To affirm the dice throw, specifically to affirm the necessity of the result, to, to affirm the result of the dice as necessity, means that one has to remain loyal to that over time. The results of the dice throw that I encounter today stick with me tomorrow and the next day, despite the different results that future dice throws are going to give me. The challenge is to remain faithful to this succession of dice throws. The obligation is to remain integral, to continue to affirm the results of a previous dice throw, despite the dice throws of the next day and the following days. Okay, so the socially liberal nihilist who cites Deleuze or the eternal recurrence as a justification for living a dissolute life, for instance, for constantly neglecting one's obligations, for not being faithful or loyal on some excuse that everything is just a dice throw and go with the flow, man. This is bad faith. This is actually the resentful attitude that Nietzsche and Deleuze are both trying to prevent. 
so to draw out, for example, the social or political implications, let me give you a concrete example following on the example I gave you with the socially liberal, dissolute nihilist, romantic relationships, that is. To affirm the dice throw, to think through the eternal recurrence would mean that, let's say you fall in love with a high school sweetheart when you're 14 years old or 16 years old, assuming age of consent, of course. You should probably marry your high school sweetheart. If you fall in love, then you should be faithful to that falling in love. And you should marry your high school sweetheart. And then as you grow, maybe you, you, it turns out that your partner is not who you thought they were. But the dice have already been thrown and you have to remain loyal to that commitment. You have to affirm that necessity of the previous dice throw. So if your partner is not what you thought they were, well, this is a challenge. This is interesting. It might be difficult, but this is actually a prompt to become creative. It's precisely the obligation to remain faithful to that previous dice throw that is the most powerful motive force for genuine creativity. One has to rethink who one is. One has to rethink who the other person is. And one has to get creative in either one's narrative about that person, one's narrative about oneself, or one's behaviors, one's communicative practices with that other. The obligation and fidelity to the previous dice throw locks one in to commitments. Even if those commitments in the past were purely due to chance, even if you feel like they were a mistake, this non-resentful attitude towards life that's evoked by the idea of the eternal recurrence requires one to have an affirmative attitude towards everything that has happened in one's past, even if you feel like something was a mistake or a bit of bad luck. So in a way that a lot of people don't appreciate, this idea of the eternal recurrence and especially Deleuze's interpretation of it as this dice throw, it actually re-solidifies a very, what I would call based cultural politics not exactly reactionary, but culturally conservative in a kind of radical or liberating way. A kind of cultural conservatism that is consistent with the left-wing traditions of thinking about emancipation and liberation, but through a kind of radically grounded type of cultural conservatism. Or rather, it's not so much that it's conservative, because in some sense it's beyond ideology, but what I'm saying is that these ideas are bound to be coded today in contemporary culture wars as conservative. So I'm just confronting that and acknowledging that there is a set of ideas that are likely to be coded as culturally conservative, but through which a smarter and more effective, real radical revolutionary politics becomes possible. And I think this is a, an absolutely good example. The eternal recurrence or the dice throw is not a justification for socially liberal, dissolute lifestyles, as it sadly often seems this way. It actually calls on us to think through the ineluctable pervasiveness of chance, the constant, incessant return of difference that is essentially the movement of time itself. And it gives us a way of thinking about our own obligation to the past, into the future, in a way that doesn't rely on supernatural notions of God, and in a way that doesn't require any type of external entity or external justification, but is purely imminent to one's own life, to one's own past experiences. It's a way of living a non-resentful life that is integrated past, present, and future without relying on anything else for support or anyone else for support other than the entities or beings with, with which you have become irreversibly bonded, whether that be through chance or mistake or through conscious and intelligent deliberation. So this is a really good example of what I mean by based to lose.
He's much more concrete and grounded than people think. His teachings are much more about traditional virtues and traditional values than almost anyone writing about Deleuze has been willing to see, let alone elaborate or expound on. 